Smile, small incision lenticule extraction. In this video, we cover the basics on how to perform a routine smile surgery case. Hair, we watch as the aggravating glass cone of the Visimax laser is soon about to dock on the patient's cornea. But two critically important things have already happened up to this point in the surgery. The first is, I have already identified the patient's visual axis. For the smile surgery to be successful, the treatment needs to be centered on the patient's visual axis, which is not necessarily the patient's pupillary axis. In myopes, the visual axis tends to be slightly inferior, nasal, or infranasal. And while I'm making some small, fine-tuned adjustments, you may notice some ink marks at the 0 and 180 degree positions. These are to help align the cone because the patient has a significant amount of astigmatism. We have just established suction and we're about to start the smile surgery. This first outside-in cut is the refractive cut or lenticule cut, and this is what is actually treating the patient's refractive error. Next, if you look at the periphery, the side cut or the edges of the lenticular are established. Then this inside-out cut, which establishes the top of the lenticule of the smile pocket. And then finally, the superior incision, which will give us access to the lenticule. That entire process of creating the lenticule took exactly 24 seconds on the dot, and that holds true regardless of whether the patient has a minus 1.5 refractive error or a minus 8.5 refractive error. The time to create the lenticule is the exact same. Now, just as with LASIK, the surgeon can choose to proceed in a variety of different sequences. For example, if a surgeon chooses to, they can create the LASIK flap, lift the flap, do the treatment ablation, lay the flap back down, and then move on to the second eye and repeat the same sequence of events. However, most refractive surgeons will prefer to create the flap in each eye and then do the treatment. Similarly, with smile, some surgeons prefer to create the lenticule, dissect it, extract it out, and then do the same thing in the other eye. However, I've found that it's more efficient to just create the lenticule in each eye, be done with the laser, the patient's relieved, the 48 seconds of the treatment are over, and then one can proceed with the dissection and extraction. Hair, I was about to dock on the cornea, but I saw that horizontal white line on the cone. This is a new glass cone, so I'm not really sure what that debris was, but it's extremely important that nothing be blocking the laser when it creates the lenticule, Otherwise, it can lead to a patchy area of what look like black spots, sometimes referred to as black artifact, which can lead to a sticky dissection. Now, this is the patient's left eye. And as I'm docking on the cornea, I'm trying to align the green blinking light with the visual axis, which is again infranasal. However, I'm slightly over applinated here. And when I hit suction, you may have noticed that the light jumped a little bit to the corneal apex. Thankfully, it's aligned with the visual axis, and there are no large folds in the epithelium. If you see folds, stop and redock. So again, the outside in cut, maximizing the amount of time the patient is seeing that green blinking light. And it's really important that the patient be able to see the light for as long as possible, because then that reduces the chances of a patient having a suction break. With the smile procedure, if a patient breaks suction, it is relatively easy to redock and reestablish the treatment. However, if the suction break happens during the refractive cut after the first 10%, one has to abort the treatment and convert to LASIK. This will not affect the patient's final visual outcome. They will still be seeing 2020 or 2015 on day one. However, you cannot proceed with the smile treatment if a suction break happens during the last 90% of the refractive cut. Here, we're just putting a little BSS on the cornea, and you're gonna see me center the laser hair in our field of view, and I will take the smile dissector, open up the smile incision, and I tip the instrument anteriorly to define the anterior plane. Now I go posteriorly to create the posterior pocket. And as I move the instrument back, I notice it goes past midline, and there was no resistance there, which tells me I'm still in the anterior plane. So I go again posteriorly, a little more resistance, that feels right, and there's the hard stop. So now I know that I've defined the anterior and posterior planes. It is safe to proceed. I insert the dissector at an angle. Again, using the air bubbles created by the Visimax laser to actually confirm and tell me that I'm in the anterior plane. And I'm just gently doing a 360 degree dissection of the anterior plane. You can see there are no subconjunctival hemorrhages. The Visimax is a very gentle laser. 
It aggravates the cornea, but it does not touch the conjunctiva or the sclera. And the IOP increase from the laser is very minimal. It is rare that I see a subconjunctival hemorrhage with the laser. So now just gently going in posteriorly, and I'm breaking the lenticular adhesions, breaking my anchor points. And you can see that the lenticule just gently comes out nicely here. And I'm just smoothing it out. Even though I know it came out in one piece, I want to make sure that there is no chance of having any tissue remnants or tags in the interface. Now, some surgeons will skip this next step, which is where I take the irrigation cannula, re-enter the smile pocket, and just gently flush out the interface. Those who do not perform this step feel like unnecessary entry into the smile pocket could introduce mybum or other debris into the interface. Similar to how one wants to avoid going in and out of a phaco incisions unless one needs to, the thought is that, again, excessive in and out motion or introduction of fluid could lead to an increased amount of postoperative day one edema. However, in my opinion, my personal opinion, I would much rather have a patient have a blurry or hazy day one 2020 vision with a pristine interface then be looking at the slit lamp and see something like my bum or an eyelash or some outside debris, which will then make me need to take the patient either back to the laser or lead to some ergonomically difficult flushing out of the smile pocket at the slit lamp. It can be done, and I've certainly done it, but psychologically, it's just not pleasing for the patient. I'm already here at the laser. The eyelid speculum is in place. The patient is in the supine position. I have great visualization. It takes me just one second to just gently irrigate out the smile pocket. So we move to the second eye hair and we're taping the eyelids and lashes out of the way. And you can see we have good draping covering the meibomian gland orifices and all the eyelashes are taped out of the way. The eyelid speculum is being inserted into place and we will now proceed with the second smile dissection. Something you may have noticed is I'm not fixating the eye. That is, I'm not using one of my hands to grasp at the limbus or the conjunctiva or the sclera to hold the eye in primary position. I'm just using the dissector to complete the entire dissection. I would say I'm in the minority of surgeons who does it this way. The majority of surgeons prefer to fixate the eye. However, I've found that in most cases, you don't need to do this. And with time and repetition, it is easy to acquire the skill of just using one and to do the dissection as opposed to fixating the eye. The benefits of this are obviously that there's a reduced chance of causing a subconjunctival hemorrhage, there's less pain for the patient because you're not grasping the conj, and of course to the onlooker, it's slightly less garish than seeing someone hold the eye with a pair of forceps. Now those who routinely fixate the eye will often say, well, if you apply some lidocaine or some neosinephrine or some numbing agent, and you grasp properly, not just the conj, but also a little bit of sclera, the patient should not really feel anything, and there should be no subconjunctival hemorrhages. I don't disagree with that philosophy. I just think that if you're going to be grabbing conjunctival with a metal forcep, it is impossible to 100% of the time not have a subconjunctival hemorrhage. Simple difference of opinion. The one time I will fixate the eye is in the instance of a cap tear, or an incredibly sticky dissection, and there I agree, grasping the conj, fixating the eye, definitely gives the appropriate and necessary amount of countertraction. Here I'm just going in with forceps, there's a little bit of adhesion left, and so just gently I'm using my second hand, going in with the smile dissector, and we just gently remove the lenticule out of the interface, and again I'm just going to spread it out here. This is good muscle memory. I know that the whole lenticule is out, but again, I do not want to leave any tissue tags behind. They can be easily removed, but it's a painstaking process, and it's just much easier to get the lenticule out all in one piece. Again, I do not want to be at the slit lamp realizing that I've left a little bit of tissue behind, and now I have to take the patient back into the laser suite. I have to redrape their eyes. I have to put the speculum in again. We have to give them numbing agents. And much easier to avoid that entire process by just taking the few seconds spread out the lenticule once it's been extracted and just to make sure you have the whole thing. These final steps, I'm just squeegeeing out the fluid from the interface. Again, we're just trying to milk out any excessive fluid in the interface, any debris, and all of that will lead to a faster 
2020 or 2015 day one visual outcome for the patient. There is a little loose epithelium at the incision edge here. This will heal in nicely and will be of no consequence. The patient may be in slight discomfort for the rest of the day, but certainly by the next day, they will feel fine. There are so many other steps and points to cover. Not enough time in this video. Stay tuned for more videos about smile surgery. Inform a refractive and cataract surgery content. Subscribe.